Good afternoon. Welcome to Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Speaker Series, Integrating Content on American Indian Law and Indigenous Identities. My name is Anna Barraza. I am the Director of Diversity and Outreach for the Roger Williams University School of Law. I'm going to read our land and labor acknowledgement. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places, physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial. And to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located here in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and honor the Narragansett and Poconocket people and Sawams, the original name of the land that our campus resides on. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it wasn't for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land our campus resides on have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, Rhode Island, and more specifically Bristol was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. During this time of national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is building and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students who soon will be practitioners of law can be and already are agents of change as well. And for those who are not familiar with this practice, why do we do a land and labor acknowledgement? I wanna share with you a statement from Northwestern University's Native American and Indigenous Initiatives, which explains it much better than I could. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements and labor acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or a historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Thank you very much. I introduce to you, Nicole Dyslewski, who will be our host for the afternoon. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Speaker Series. Uh, this is our second event in our second year of holding these sessions. And I am very excited about today's speaker. Um, today's speakers. Today's event, Integrating Content on American Indian Law and Indigenous Identities, features three experts, Matthew, Monty, and Rebecca. I, I feel really honored to speak with the three of you today and want to dive right in. Um, thank you for taking the time to share your insights with us. I'm going to start with our first panelist, Matthew Fletcher. Matthew is the Harry Burns Hutchins Collegiate Professor of Law at Michigan Law. He teaches and writes in the areas of federal Indian law, American tribal law, Anishinaabe legal and political philosophy, constitutional law, federal courts, and legal ethics. He was the lead reporter for the American Law Institute's Restatement of the Law of American Indians, completed in 2022, and is the primary editor and author of the leading law blog on American Indian Law and Policy, Turtle Talk. Matthew is also an author of an essay in our forthcoming follow-up book, Integrating Doctrine and Diversity Beyond the First Year. To start us off, I want to point out that so, mem so many members of our audience and colleagues beyond our session today are working to integrate diverse content and perspectives into their classes. And um, the questions I get from the legal education community often come more from a fear uh, or for their or being afraid of their own lack of knowledge um, than, it, than they do from a place of unwillingness to integrate this content. With that stated, my first question is a very basic one, but is one that I have gotten the most often um, in this area of law. Matthew, can you address how professors should most respectfully be referring to the topic of Indian law and the tribal people involved in the disputes? 
Should professors be calling this Indian law or is that an antiquated term? Should we, we, should we be referring to tribe members as indigenous peoples, native peoples? Should we be referring to them by their tribal affiliation? Um, can you just start us off with some of the best practices in this regard? Yeah, I'll try. I think it's very much uh, uh, how the how comfortable the professor feels and how and who the audience is. So, um, so Indian, the word Indian, of course, is uh, is completely incorrect in every way. This is not India. People in this continent are not Indians, so to speak. But it is um, what we say and what we do. The classes are typically called federal Indian law, American Indian law, something to that effect. Uh, the Constitution uses the phrase uh, or the, and the phrase Indian tribes and the term Indians not taxed. Um, two thirds, I would guess, maybe three quarters of all the statutes passed in Indian affairs use the word Indian. Um, it's just the if you're going to teach the class, you've got to use the word. It's fair to you know, to hedge and say, hey, you know, this is not a correct term. Um, but it's also fair to say we're going to use this term and we're going to use it. It's, uh, you know, we're going to use it uh, reasonably. It is sort of been recovered um, by, by Indian people. And, you know, going all the way back to the American Indian movement, which took it very seriously to use uh, intentionally and uh, use that term. Uh, so it's, it's fine. You probably can't get away with that um, in Canada. That is not a word that is uh, that is acceptable in, in Canada, but in the United States, in most audiences, you'll be just fine. I won't have to even explain yourself. Um, and, you know, people in the United States who are Native tend to identify themselves as um, uh, their, their tribal affiliation, and uh, they'll do that themselves. And, you know, when you do a land acknowledgement like you just did, um, that that helps a great deal. So um, it's it's totally fine to use the word Indian, totally fine to focus on the tribal affiliation of people. And, you know, it's also, you know, let's let's be frank, you know, when you have the question, should we use Indian? Who are you? What are you doing? It's usually, uh, not usually, excuse me, often, and unfortunately too often, is an effort to put people in their place to, you know, to say here, well, who are you exactly? And so to sort of recast and associate and re reinforce uh, the racial hierarchy hierarchies that we have in this country. So use the word, it shouldn't be a problem. And, but just understand and, and know what you need to, to know in order to use it effectively and um, in the right way. Thanks, Matthew. Um, it seems kind of strange to me to be asking such a fundamental question to such respected legal scholars. But uh, like I said, in my experience, people shy away from integrating diverse content and diverse voices because they don't feel like they have the knowledge or skills to do the material justice and to approach the topics with proper respect. Um, and so I want people to hear, hey, you might be hesitant to do this um, and it might sound wrong, but you need to go and do it anyway. Um, I, I spent today uh, watching YouTube videos so I could, per so I could correctly pronounce things. Um, and if I get them wrong, I hope someone corrects me. Um, my hope is that hearing the answers to these questions from such distinguished legal scholars will help professors have a bit more confidence in themselves while they're doing the work. Um, my next question is for Monty. Monty Mills joined the University of Washington School of Law faculty in 2022 as the Charles I. Stone Professor of Law and the Director of the Native American Law Center. He teaches American Indian law, property, and other classes focused on Native American and natural resources related topics. Monty also co-authored an essay in our first Integrating Doctrine and Diversity book. Monty, in that essay, you and your co-authors stated, our professional obligations as lawyers demand that we disrupt and end racism. Unfortunately, our approach to developing the professional identity of law students overlooks the racism endemic in the law, legal system, profession, and legal education. While students may take electives in critical race theory or intern in clinics that take racism head on, law schools generally do not require them to wrestle with how the legal system created and perpetuates racism, 
nor do they develop the values and skills necessary to respond effectively to and ultimately dismantle it. The essay was written well before the changes to ABA Standard 303 were adopted. And now all law schools are to some extent wrestling with this very issue. Can you please share some of your perspectives on how to take racism head on, teach law effectively, integrate Indian law topics and help students develop their professional identities all at the same time? Um, based on your experiences, are you able to share some specific strategies or thoughts about how to do this within the context of a class which is not specifically on federal Indian law? Sure, I'll, I'll offer some thoughts, certainly not uh, any magic bullets or, or um, entire solutions. And I think that's a, an important starting point is that it's about the work and the process and continuing to educate and, and get better at it. It's impossible, I think, to ever arrive at um, the perfect approach to any of this stuff, which is part of what makes the challenge um, so great. Um, I do want to say just thank you for, for having me on this panel, and I particularly appreciated the acknowledgement of land and labor, and particularly the recognition of the continuing um, potential and, and impacts of colonialism. And I think that's, that's really where um, we could think about how to integrate these topics into, into other courses. And, and for me, at least, the starting point is recognizing that we're all doing this already. Um, we're all helping develop the professional identity of our students. We are all addressing race and racism in our courses. Um, we are all working toward preparing our students for the practice of law. The question is whether we're doing it with an explicit focus on anti-racism and, and approaching it in a particularly open and um, intentional way, or whether, um, as I think the historical and traditional practices of, of much of our uh, profession in academia has been, we're ignoring or excusing a lot of those aspects of the work that we do. Um, and so I would say first and foremost, it, it, a step that anybody can take is just recognizing we're, we're all doing this already. And the question is the extent to which we do so with an acknowledgement of the broader context and history and really practices of our profession um, that for the most part, you know, haven't really changed, uh, it, it, particularly since the late 1800s, but um, even before that. So I think that's a that's a pretty low bar uh, for everybody to sort of think a little bit more deeply about what is what, what is explicitly delivered in the curriculum, but maybe more importantly, what's implicitly delivered in the curriculum and what messages we're sending our students. And I'd say that's true with regard to incorporating Indian law topics as well. Um, I like to say that uh, the true test is not whether Indian law can be incorporated into the broader law school curriculum, but whether the broader law school curriculum can be incorporated into Indian law, because they're really, you, you mentioned, how do you do this in a course that's not specifically about Indian law? Well, Arguably, the only reason a course isn't specifically about Indian laws, those parts of that area of the law just aren't being considered or presented. And part of that is the canon and part of that is the, the research and the textbooks. And, and I think, fortunately, as Matthew, a number of other scholars are, are beginning to point out, that is just leaving out a whole nother part of the story of our legal system and, and true American law in a lot of ways. And so particularly for folks who are teaching in areas where it may not be explicit the connection or the, the relevance or the importance of Indian law or tribal law along those areas. There are ways, even within a specific legal area, to explore those overlaps and those connections. And you know, if you're familiar with contract law or you're familiar with secure transactions or you're familiar with intellectual property, you can find ways in which those areas of the law connect up with both federal Indian law and maybe more importantly, and maybe more powerfully tribal law. And that's an a, a easier avenue potentially than to get into seeing other ways in which these um, other governments and, and the American legal system has uh, addressed questions of indigenous rights and, and Indian law more broadly. So I'd say start there and, I, and just start with the recognition that whatever choices you make in, in your curriculum, you're doing something about these questions. And it's just what you want to do with it and recognizing, last thing I'll say, acknowledging you may not be an expert in federal Indian law or tribal law. That's okay. Um, I think there's a tendency for all of us to, to want to have the answer to every question and be the expert on the stage and make sure that our students don't ask anything that we can't answer. 
Um, but I think just, just taking time to do the work, um, even if that comes from a position of your own expertise and then expands into these other areas, um, can really be fruitful in terms of opening up other ideas and avenues that then you can pursue. Monty, you, that was such a great answer uh, because you're explicitly asking law professors to be vulnerable. Um, and we are not good at that. Um, and I like that you bring that up. Um, it's really important to me and through this whole series that we talk about, it's not that we have to be the expert at everything. Um, and it's okay to say when we're not. And I know that that impacts different professors with different identities differently. But I do think it's important that as a profession, we start to lean more into vulnerability and less into sage on the stage. Um, so the question I asked is how to weave content about Indian law and indigenous identities into doctrinal classes. Um, but I admit that weave is the wrong word. Um, so is the word inject or integrate or infuse. And the words are improper because Indian law and indigenous identities are in the law and are the law in ways that I am insufficiently describing. And really what I feel like I'm suggesting and what I think Monty is alluding to is how we stop whitewashing the curriculum instead of how we figure out how to add something. So it becomes less about, well, how do I get one more case or one more idea in? and more about how do I have an honest reckoning with the material that's been there the whole time. Um, another question that sort of runs alongside this for me is how not to do this. Um, I was really struck, Matthew, by your 1998 piece, Listen, about your experiences as a law student in the classroom. I'm gonna read an excerpt from it so those engaging here with us today can fully understand the question I'm about to ask. Quote, at eight o'clock in the morning on a freezing January day, my brain is rusted and struck. The professor talks at us law students for 20 minutes about Mac, uh, Johnson v. McIntosh. His tone is somber, but his voice, voice is soothing. It is a story that we will just have to get through, he says. True, it is unpleasant and sad, but it will be over soon. Sometimes law takes a bad road, the professor acknowledges. Let's move on. The story of Johnson v. McIntosh, the story of conquest, murder, starvation, disease, betrayal, has been laid down before for all of us to hear. No reason to go over it again. The lesson has been learned already. It's a real downer. Why dwell on it at eight o'clock in the morning on a freezing January day when there is so much ahead to learn an almost unimaginable amount of information about property to master in only four months? I can hear the students now agreeing silently with the professor. We already know this story. We've heard it before. Let us not, let us not waste time. Let's move on. The 20 minute talk about Johnson v. McIntosh lasts only about 10 seconds in the weird temporal scene in Hutchins Hall. Before it sunk in, the professor began talking about the property issues of fox hunting. When I read this, it really struck me to my core. Um, it is not just about how we introduce these topics or when in the classroom, but it is about the time and energy and passion and respect and honor we give these topics. Um, Matthew, can you talk a bit based on your experiences as a law student and a law professor about how professors should engage with the materials in a way which is respectful and honors those cultures, peoples, and traditions who have been marginalized. Thanks, I'll, I'll try, Nicole. Um, thanks for digging up that extremely old law review article, uh, the first one I ever published. And um, so uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to um, answer that question in a short period of time, but I'll give it a shot. Let me tell you a little bit about Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, and at the time I took the class, certainly in 1995, January 95, and wrote this paper in 1998. I didn't, I didn't know this, but Johnson versus McIntosh had only recently entered the canon, so to speak, of property case books. Uh, 70s, 80s, maybe even into the early 90s, more progressive property professors were trying to uh, incorporate some Indian law into their property classes. And the, the reason they really wanted to do that, and in some respects, now that I think about it, is as kind of a proto-land acknowledgement that 
uh, the sense that um, all lands uh, in the United States originated, uh, originally were belonged to indigenous peoples and um, somehow were alienated to, you know, the European powers, the colonizing powers that came in with the prime beneficiary being the United States uh, and the citizens of the United States, most, mostly the wealthy, already wealthy citizens of the United States, even to this day. Um, and so I think what happened um, was that Johnson versus McIntosh was taught in the most superficial way possible for so many of us who took property in the 90s and aughties and maybe even today to some extent. Um, and what I mean by that is we were, we were introduced to the ideas of Johnson versus McIntosh as this is, and I remember this specifically was in my case book and also the professor who, by the way, um, was, it was the first time my professor had taught property. He was very open about that. In a lot of respects, I liked him because of his um, willingness to uh, acknowledge his own vulnerabilities and um, insecurities even, and certainly in experience. But he said, look, this is, the, this is where all property in the United States comes from. It all comes from this case, Johnson versus McIntosh, which is not true at all. Um, you know, the, the principles of Johnson versus McIntosh, for the most part, the most important things that you actually learn are not really property principles. They're about federal control and federal power over Indian affairs. And that includes who is going to be authorized to purchase lands from Indians and Indian tribes. And um, the, the only property principle that shows up in Johnson versus McIntosh is the introduction of a principle that had been kicking around in theory up until that time, which was that at the time of the arrival of the colonizing nations, the colonizers, Indian tribes didn't really own their property in a way that um, the, the colonizers owned their property. Um, and the reason for that, of course, was that Indian tribes under this theory were subhuman. They were not actually, uh, you know, they were not human enough to, to actually own property in a way that uh, was uh, respected by the colonizers. So those are the, the two key principles of that case. And um, how do you teach the principle of property to law students in their first year? Um, when the only principle or real principle of property in the case was that Indian people, indigenous people were subhuman and therefore they didn't really own their land effectively. So there's a lot of obfuscation. There's a lot of denial. Um, there's an, there's an effort, I think, by property professors or was, and maybe still is to just get past it as soon as you can and say, yeah, we, it's sort of like a land acknowledgement. We know that this used to be Indian land. Let's move on. Let's talk about foxes. Let's talk about um, anything else, but you know where the, the chain of title that exists in every single piece of property in the United States, and that that's the real that's the real harm with of introducing Johnson v. McIntosh. I think it comes from a really good place, but I think the outcome itself was very alienating for somebody like me. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I was the only Native person in my first year property section. Um, it, property was really, really a difficult thing for me emotionally, knowing that uh, most of the property in the United States uh, doesn't be belongs to a very small number of people. And, um, you know, it was, and, and that's, that's totally ir irrespect, uh, irrespective of the fact that I was an indigenous, a descendant of indigenous peoples. So. It was it was very difficult, and um, I know it was difficult for my professor, who was just trying to get out of there without suffering any real huge embarrassment. And I also know uh, I strongly suspect that virtually everyone else in that classroom wanted to move on from talking about Johnson versus McIntosh and Indian peoples because one or, one of two reasons or both. One reason is that Johnson versus McIntosh is not on the bar exam. And most people take property not because of the intellectual curiosity about theories of property, but because it's on the bar exam. And the other reason, of course, is that you don't want to talk about Indians. Um, I wrote a whole book called Ghost Road, where I explained um, my thoughts about why people really don't like Indians very much. 
And the one thing about Indians that people really don't like is that they know that Indian people are still here and this land used to belong to them and all of the resources upon the land. And um, it's a sense of shame and embarrassment for pretty much everybody in the United States who, who, is, not, who is a beneficiary of all of this. So it's, it was, it's a terrible emotional struggle. And if it done improperly, done wrongly, um, can cause a lot of damage. And um, I'm not here to blame my property professor for any of that stuff. I haven't spoken to him since the class. I, you know, I barely even remember his name, but um, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to do that. Now, broadly, how do you put this material in a way, how do I do this as a professor? Um, what, I, what I do is I play around with something called um, historical gossip. So the, thankfully for Johnson versus McIntosh, there are entire books written about all of the stuff involving historical goss gossip about Johnson versus McIntosh. How Johnson was actually a former Supreme Court justice, how the case was a sham, that the parties were actually both, both attorneys and uh, for, each, for each party were paid for by a third party to create a sham Supreme Court decision. Um, all sorts of good stuff. And the way that you, you can delve into the materials in any case, any class um, that in, has a case involving indigenous peoples is to, you really have to look beyond, beyond the four corners of the textbook. Um, it's more work for a professor, but there are cases involving Indians that, that find themselves into case books. Um, notoriously, there's a case in torts, which is about, um, and if you read it, you'll think it's about parents who refuse to take their kid to the hospital and the kid dies. Um, I can never remember the name of that case. Hopefully somebody in the Q&A can remember it. Virtually for 30 years, 40 years, um, it's been in virtually every torts case book. Everybody reads it. Everybody hates those parents. They're the worst people of all time. Those people were native people who knew that if they took their sick child to the hospital, that, that they would never see that child again. The state would remove that child um, and, and, and put them in foster care uh, and adopt them out and they would never see their kid again. And so maybe or maybe not in terms of whether it was justifiable to remove that child and take that child to the hospital um, is, is a harder question than you would know from reading the materials. And that's the, that's the real rub. We do, I do this at Indian Law as well. It, it helps to sort of humanize the cases in a way um, that's respectful to all the parties. And that's sort of my personal uh, take on how to, how, to do this, how to do this really difficult stuff in terms of dealing with these cases that have um, a lot of disrespectful overtones is to try to humanize and to learn about the people involved. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to Rebecca to hear your perspective on this topic. Um, Rebecca Plovel is a reference librarian and teaches in the 1L Legal Research Analysis and Writing Program at the University of South Carolina Law School. Rebecca practiced law in Arizona for 30 years. She was the chief prosecutor for the Gila River Indian Community, a deputy county attorney for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, the Action Indian Community Prosecutor, the Pasqua Yaqui Tribal Prosecutor, and an Assistant General Counsel with the White Mountain Apache Tribe. Rebecca still serves as a Justice Pro Tem for the Pasqua Yaqui Court of Appeals. Um, Rebecca, can you talk a little bit, based on your identity and your experiences as a law student and a law professor, about how professors should engage with the materials in a way which is respectful and honors the cultures, peoples, and traditions which have been marginalized? Sure. <clears throat> um, I won't repeat everything that Matthew and Monty just said because, yes. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, first of all, I'm a member of the Muskogee Creek Nation, which is part of Oklahoma Indian, Indian Territory. But I only spent a few summer vacations at my great grandmother's home in Bixby, just south of Tulsa. Um, but I got to spend time with my extended family there in Oklahoma. My great aunt, my grandmother's sister, uh, worked for the tribe for most of her adult career work um, before she retired in the, um, as an executive assistant in the principal chief's office um, at Muscogee Creek. And so I had those connections, but I grew up in Arizona and California. Um, 
away from my own community. And I knew it was there. It was just part of my history. Um, and when I went to law school, I lucked out in being assigned to Professor Rob Williams' 1L property law class. And if anybody knows who he is, um, I think he's now one, uh, one of the author, lead authors, I think on the Getchies Indian Law book. Um, but he started property law with papal bulls, manifest destiny, and talking about land thefts in the colonies from the, here in the US um, that came out of that colonization by the Spaniards, which started with Columbus's ill-fated trips. And there were a whole lot of students in my class that didn't appreciate that, that we were getting that much more complete history about property here in the United States and where these lands came from is a bad way to put it, but that was kind of, I can remember several of the students in that class just shaking their heads going, when are we gonna actually talk about property law? And my thinking was, that's what we're talking about, property law. Um, and so I got that cloak, that mantle, that immersion into Indian law really early in my law career, my 1L year. And I thank Rob every day for it. <clears throat> um, I clerked for a tribal judge at Pasquayaki. I did an internship. Professor Williams actually found me some fellowship money. So I got to spend another semester out there uh, clerking for the judge, um, helping, him, helping him draft rules of court, um, helping, they were working on a juvenile code. So I helped doing some of that drafting for the tribe and for the tribal court, which is great. And then the end of my 2L year, Duro v. Reyna came out from the Supreme Court, which said that one Indian tribe cannot prosecute a non-member Indian in tribal court for a crime committed on that reservation. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me given what I knew at that point. And that just went, okay, this is where I wanna be. This is what I need to be doing. Um, I went into law school thinking juvenile. I was gonna be a juvenile lawyer. <laughs> Um, and this piece pushed me to wanting to do tribal law. Um, I plan to write my substantial paper on how to fix that Duro v. Reyna decision. Well, Congress fixed it well before my paper was written, so I had to come up with a different process. But I talked to Duro's attorney, who was a Flagstaff attorney. A classmate of mine was from Flagstaff, knew him, and made the introduction. So I interviewed him in preparation for writing my paper. And at the time I didn't understand how he could be arguing against tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty. Um, Duro was, I don't remember which tribe in Northern Arizona and the crime was committed at Gila River. And now that I have been through a long career in the law, I get, and I understand where he was coming from, representing his client to the best of his abilities. He was actually a court appointed attorney to represent Duro in federal court. And so, and he was basing you know, his arguments on the Supreme Court's prior precedents that kept shrinking tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty. Um, he was doing a lot of criminal defense at the time and something I did later on doing criminal defense, but it, he, his viewpoint gave me a much better understanding of why he made the arguments he did as I learned more. Um, I got to know him because I worked in Flagstaff. He was a good attorney, um, but it was one of those things like, how can you do this? But his focus was his client, not the bigger picture. And as Matthew just said, personalizing all that stuff, personalizing the cases, the parties, um, because I was seeing, you know, Duro v. Reyna as a law school problem, and he was seeing Duro as a client, <laughs> as, as a person who was getting, um, had been convicted in tribal court of a pretty heinous crime. So it just is one of those things where finding out that is that history, that information, that personalization of cases. And one thing they've talked a little bit about is what I found and still find is all of the subjects I studied in law school, all of my areas of practice, whether I did those 
in or around or out of Indian country, that juvenile law, criminal, torts, contracts, property, employment law, con law, evidence, civil and criminal procedure. All of that goes on in tribal court. It's maybe a slightly different angle on stuff. Uh, you've got a different community and traditions and a different sovereign, but you're still practicing law. And it's really not that different in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, I think I got way off your question here. I apologize. Um, it's a recognition. Uh, we're working here on a land and labor or land and labor acknowledgement. And the struggle that I'm having with it is that whether the university, whether the law school can and will recognize and acknowledge their part in that dispossession and do something to make it better because I think that has to be there. That has to be a part of it. And I know that's kind of a later question, but I get to be retired from practice now as of the end of this summer and just be a law teacher and a librarian and loving it because I get to impart some of that history that I've learned to my students. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm actually gonna follow up with that. Um, so you teach research skills to one else. Can you talk about the ways in which you integrate tribal law and indigenous issues into this instruction? Do you specifically show 1Ls where to find tribal law and West law and Lexus? Do you use Indian law issues in your research assignments? And have you encountered any hurdles doing this work? The biggest hurdle I have with it right now is I'm so constrained with our current curriculum. Um, our 1L legal research program has a bunch of different sections and we all teach basically the same curriculum. So they all have the same kind of writing problems throughout the semester. And so I don't have a whole lot of time to add extra stuff. What I did do is <clears throat> we have a textbook that the program here has created. So we've got our own legal research text. It's online, it's on the LibGuides platform and it's now actually open and I can send the link on here in a minute, but we rewrite or we update it every year. And so all of us librarians that teach in the program get a couple of units to update each year. And one of those that I updated this year was our US legal systems. I was like, yay, I can put tribal law in there. And I did, I basically put a little piece in, um, and I wanna quote this right, I don't wanna misquote myself, um, is that the US legal system includes three systems of government, federal, state, and tribal, and that each has its own sets of laws, um, that there aren't just the two systems, <laughs> state and federal. Um, and then I also talk about the four sources of law that we all kind of study, constitution, states, statutes and ordinances, rules and regulations, and case law. And then I add that you also have to be aware that tribal laws also come from those same four sources, but they have a fifth source as well, which is customs and tradition. And each tribe's is different and each tribe has a different weight that they put on that. And we don't get to get into much discussion. Uh, students ask and I will tell them what my experience is. I have no problem doing that. We got totally off track one day in class. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you guys have more homework now. Um, and so I talked, I put in a little bit of a short explanation about kind of those foundational concepts and I quoted out of um, Cohen's handbook about tribal powers being inherent rather than coming from the federal government. Um, and so I give them a little bit, but I don't have time in our 1L class to um, really get into it. There just isn't time to do it in the program. Um, if I can wrangle it out and do it, I would love to teach some advanced legal research on Indian research and do a little bit of federal stuff, but also talk about the tribal law stuff. I'm also updating for our spring semester federal regulations and just using examples in the federal regs, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, various regulations, and using some of those as examples in our exercises. So they'll at least have some exposure that there's stuff out there. Um, that they can use. So 
looking at my notes here. Um, the other thing I do is, you know, like I said, I got off track one day in class because students were asking me questions. And so I was talking to them about my, my experience and working in Indian country. Um, and I'm more than willing to do that. I got called by a librarian at another law school saying, our professor that teaches American Indian law would love to have you come talk to your cl her class. So I did a Zoom class with them. Um, I'm gonna talk to one of our um, professors here, talk to her conflicts of law class about Indian law, which is, you know, great. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so my next two questions are for everybody on the panel who would like to answer them and they're more, more holistic to legal education generally. Um, the first question is, how do you all advise law professors and administrators to deal with the issue of Columbus Day within and beyond the classroom? And whoever wants to start can start. Hi there. I, my law school just asked me to write an essay about Columbus Day. Um, so I did. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of my own idiosyncratic take on what it's about, but, um, you know, I, I think I could probably give you a link to the thing I wrote, but, you know, I, I'm not really sure what to say. I think I don't spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, you know, so it's, it's Indigenous Peoples Day for a lot of people, but it's a Columbus Day for a lot of other people. And, um, you know, my sense is that, uh, the, the fights over whether or not to have a Indigenous Peoples Day or Columbus Day tend to be more about um, uh, Indian Indigenous peoples sort of going down their road of calling it Indigenous Peoples Day and totally in support of that. Um, and the, on the Columbus Day end, it's not really about Columbus anymore. It's really about, um, for many people, it's about in a Italian American identity. There's really no holiday for Italian American persons, um, except for Columbus Day, and they've really uh, glommed onto it. And it's hard to um, disrespect that. They're, they're not, they don't really care as much as you would think about Columbus, is my sense. Um, Columbus Day is they're they're losing a sense of who Columbus really is. Um, so you know the the main thing that I try to remember to tell people is that there's no, there was no person named Christopher Columbus. That was never his name. Uh, he was, there, there's an Italian version of his name. There's a Spanish version of his name. There was no Christopher Columbus. That was a made up thing at the beginning uh, of the United States by a small group of people who believed that the term for America was sort of the male version of the United States. And the term for Columbia or Columbus was the female version of the United States. These these are things that nobody pays any attention to at all anymore. So um, to me, it's sort of a big nothing burger. But um, really what it is for a lot of native law professors and even those of us who do Indian law who are not native, that it's it's like an extra an extra day of labor. Because we're always asked to speak on Indigenous Peoples Day uh, or to write something about it or to, um, you know, do something. And uh, this year I wrote something and uh, I was on three panels. <laughs> so it's just extra work and I don't mind doing it. And, uh, you know, the, an, an extra holiday is not a problem, but uh, I still have to work. I mean, I've never been at a law school that takes Indigenous Peoples Day off. So um, that, I don't know, to me, it's like, uh, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, it is definitely a deal. So it, it's like paying the bills, you gotta do it. Monty and then Rebecca. I, I would only add to that. I think it's helpful to investigate and, and talk more about the historical reasons why there is a Columbus Day, the reasons why it was nationalized, as Matthew mentioned, sort of the connection to anti-Italian immigrants and, and violence against immigrants. Um, I think there's some reason to think more um, for those folks who are interested in talking about Columbus Day to understand why it is a holiday and and to Matthew's point, what it means and what it doesn't mean and, and where it came from. Um, so that would be one other um, option, but I, I think that's only to the extent that folks 
care about Columbus Day as opposed to Indigenous Peoples Day. Rebecca, anything to add? Not really. I mean, I think, I know growing up, the history I got in grade school about Columbus was totally not the truth. <laughs> um, and I think that's a lot less true now that there is a lot more information out there about what, really what happened. He didn't discover America. Um, and he was not a, a nice person at all. Um, I, in my work with tribes, none of them, of course, recognized it as Columbus Day. It was Indigenous Peoples Day, or it was something else that they called it. And whether we got it off as a vacation day or not, dependent on the tribe. I had worked for some tribes that we got all the federal holidays, whatever they were called, plus extra tribal holidays. And then I worked for a tribe that their main enterprise was farming. And so we got four holidays a year. <laughs> Christmas, New Year's, 4th of July, and I don't remember what the other one was, but so we didn't get any of the other holidays. So, you know, it's, I don't celebrate it. I think I wore one of my indigenous state slogan t-shirts that day to class <laughs> and told my students, happy indigenous day. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, one of those things that nobody's asked me what what they should be doing. And so I, you know, other than I wore my t-shirt that day, I didn't do, do much of anything. <laughs> Thanks. We have a question from the audience that hopefully uh, someone can jump in on. Um, a small group of us 2Ls at CUNY Law have been advocating for more Indian law doctrine programming, et cetera, as part of our strategy we're looking to engage with our faculty curriculum committee. My question is whether an institutional requirement for integration of this material into doctrinal classes helps or hurts the cause. Does anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll offer my two cents. Um, that Here's a couple of things that students should remember when they approach their faculty. Number one is that faculty members tend to be really uh, protective of their what they call their academic freedom. So if a faculty member doesn't want to incorporate Indian law, actively wants to avoid it, there's almost nothing you can do um, to, to, to force them to do that. And um, it can, I, I think it can be counterproductive if you uh, try to make, to mandate it. Um, I think the better way to um, incorporate, to, to get a law school to incorporate more Indian law is to persuade the law school to um, hire people to teach the class, teach a class or classes in the field. Um, I also think that the, the, the uh, administration of the law school is, uh, would be open and receptive to knowing what the market for Indian lawyers is like, that there are almost 600 federally recognized tribes. They all have need for lawyers. Um, states with significant Indian country, including New York, have significant need for lawyers within the state. Um, federal, state, local governments need Indian lawyers. Um, a lot of Native attorneys who go to kind of law schools and maybe have the kind of profile that don't generate a lot of attention from big time AMLAW 100 law firms tend to get hired at those firms. Um, it's the kind of thing that um, there's so much work in Indian law and it's high profile work that a law school is uh, hurting itself by not uh, opening those doors. That's the kind of argument that you, that you need. Um, you know, Derek Bell would have called it interest convergence, right? How do you get people in power to do the things you want them to do? Find out the, the, that what, is, what your interests are and how they align. And that's something that law schools um, Re respond to. There's a reason I'm teaching, I'm now a faculty member at the University of Michigan. It's because students spent years making all of those arguments. And if you go to them and say, you have to do this because it's the right thing to do, um, I'm going to tell you right now, almost every law school will be like, well, we're a law school. We don't do right things. We do things that are to our benefit. And so make that argument. So, um, this is an incredibly self-serving answer. However, I think that things like today are the way forward. 
I think that you can browbeat professors to an extent, or I think you can make available and give them resources to figure out if they want to lean into this work and how to lean into this work in a way that makes them confident that they can do it, manage a classroom when it happens and see how important it is to the students and to our profession. Um, one of the things that most convinced me that we need more of this is to look at the statistics about the number of attorneys who are with indigenous heritage. It, it, the, the numbers are staggeringly low. And so like, I don't know what the most effective way is, but I would say giving professors the tools to empower them to do this work themselves. They already are in, in the position to do it. So just giving them the tools to allow them to do it um, and some, persuasive, some persuasion of how important it is. And then I think add to that, that there's an open job market, that it's the, in the interest in everyone. I think that is the way forward. Monty, did you wanna jump in on this? No, I think, I think what, what Matthew advised in, in your input is, is spot on. It, I think there's benefit in having those discussions, sort of whatever form it takes. The only other thing I would mention is just that idea that um, proposing the integration of Indian law into courses can serve to perpetuate this idea that it's somehow outside of what law school is normally about and needs to be brought in. Um, and I think just recognizing that in the context of these discussions helps reduce if not eliminate that marginalization um, which has gone on you know the the idea that somehow this is a niche area of law that you know nobody's ever going to practice and in, in reality is is not true and so the more we can do to to make that go away the better rebecca i was going to just say i got hired here at south carolina as a librarian and they knew what my background was Partly, I think they hired me because of it, but I was also told, but we, South Carolina doesn't do Indian law. <laughs> well, we are doing it and we're doing, I do it every day. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm adding to our textbook. I'm offering to talk to students, to talk to teachers, to talk to professors, to come to their classes. And so I'm doing it every day, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, law schools just need to hire the the people that have some of the background and that are willing to do it. Um, I think you're right, Matthew, that students are gonna be able to browbeat any professor into incorporating stuff in their class if they're not comfortable doing it, but making the resources available that can give them that information that can help them add to their classes. Okay, my last question um, is, um, so I imagine most of those on today's session are not seasoned Indian law professors and instead are trying to integrate these identities, ideas, and concepts into classes, not specifically on Indian law. So if the three of you could give some advice on what advice would you give our audience today generally on places to start or resources on which to rely to, to do more of this within their own classes? Well, I'll, I'll say, uh, I, I think that there are Indian law case, cases in the case books already. Um, when I was in law school, I took a class called Remedies, you know, fit into my schedule. I didn't know what Remedies were. And it was a half semester class. And I thought, hey, I'll be done with this class by the end of February. And I was. Um, and what I noticed by looking at the case book years later, because again, focused only on the things aside, was that the professor that assigned all the materials skipped over all the Indian law cases. It's remedies. There were a half a dozen or more cases about um, that involved Indian tribes and um, and the professor skipped every single one of them. So, you know, embrace those cases. Uh, Indian law is all over the place in constitutional law. It's all over the place in federal courts and federal jurisdiction. It can be all over the place in property and other classes. Uh, find those cases and, and embrace them. Um, don't skip over them. By the way, the next edition of that case book, my lovely wife used for when she was at Harvard. We didn't know each other then. I looked for her edition of the case book. All of the Indian law had been scrubbed from that case book in the next edition. 
So the faculty who did that casebook took took a, took all the Indian law out, probably hearing from the people who adopted the casebook, we don't want to do Indian law. And you know, that's the 90s, but you know, it's time to time to move on to that. So you find those cases, embrace them. They're fun. The Indian law stuff is not boring. That's the great thing about Indian law, whether you're afraid of it or whatnot and worried about irritating somebody or uh, you know, embarrassing somebody uh, or even upsetting somebody, just go for it. Those are really fun cases. They really are. And you know, they're really, you know, what Indian tribes are doing are is dramatically different than what corporate entities are doing or what state, local, and federal governments are doing. They're doing things that are designed to save the world, right? And you want to teach those cases. You want to normalize the cases where you have this small, tiny Indian tribe, say in upstate Wisconsin, that is fighting, say, Enbridge. Bad River Ojibwe versus Enbridge right now. If I were teaching remedies, I would open with that, with that case. There's a case pending right now where the Enbridge pipeline is, is totally in trespass on this reservation. What happens when you have something that is a piece of property on somebody else's reservation? You're, the remedy is you take it off and pay damages. The federal court said, no, we're not taking it off because it's just Indians. And who cares? This is a case we should all be talking about all the time. I would only supplement that answer by suggesting that if you read those cases and you feel like you don't have background or context in the area, there's a ton of good resources on that end too. Check out Fletcher's comic book. He's got his work, his horn book, travel law book, Ghost Road, which you mentioned earlier. I mean, all of these things are there to help provide more background and more comfort with understanding some of the principles of Indian law that you may come across in a case about remedies that you don't know too much about. That's what they're there for. So there's other resources too that can help you feel a little bit more at ease in, in teaching courses in your area that implicate these, um, these federal Indian law or tribal law issues. My two cents is to reach out to your librarians. Law librarians are some of the most resourceful, um, smart, well-researched, genius people on our campuses, in our world, really. Um, but reach out to your law librarians and say, hey, I need some resources on this. And, and I would bet in every school or almost every school, they would trip over themselves to help you identify the content. Um, and you, you as professors have the skills. Um, and I think your law librarians are a good match because they can get you the, the support and resources that might be helpful. Um, Rebecca? Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, when you sent the announcement out and said, send this out, and I sent it to all of our faculty here at South Carolina, I got a couple of surprise re re replies back to me for just to sending it out to the listserv going, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that you had that background. I would love to pick your brain. I would love to have you come to maybe talk to my class. Can you look at my syllabus and see what else I need to add? Um, and I was like, yay. <laughs> but which was odd because they all should have known what my background was, but I guess they weren't paying attention. I'm just a librarian. I'm not a regular faculty member. But yeah. So, I'm sorry, Rebecca, I'm going to interrupt you please. because this is my show. Please do not ever say you're just a librarian. That's what they say. Right. And not, not on this panel. <laughs> no, sorry. I don't, please continue. I don't feel like I'm just a librarian at all. Um, so thank you. Uh, there are questions that we didn't get to. There are questions in the chat we didn't get to. Um, and I feel like we just got the ball rolling and time is up. Um, I want to say thank you to the panelists today. You were so good that I will email you all and ask you to come back again. Please don't dodge my emails. Um, thank you to our hosts, Roger Williams, um, CUNY Law, Berkeley Law, GW Law, and Jurist. Thank you especially to those behind the scenes like Chelsea and Morgan who do so much work. We, we, don't, we don't see them, but they're there. Um, and finally, thanks to you, to our attendees. We're doing this work because we think it's important and we're hoping that this that this uh, this content really interacts with you and, and moves you forward. Um, and 
you want to ask questions and have feedback. And so I would welcome to hear from you all. If you have thoughts, ideas, feedback, comments, need resources, um, please reach out to me um, and I can sort of get you where you need to go. Um, our next session is in November on the topic of teaching diversity skills in bar tested classes. Thanks everyone for spending some bit of their afternoon with us and have a great rest of the day.